So welcome everyone. Thank you for doing our nice little tour. That was really wonderful. Um, so tonight is the first part of the Food for Thought series um, at the library. It's community conversations about food identity and culture. So tonight's program is conversation with our expert community gardeners. Um, and unfortunately, Vanessa and we can be here tonight. Uh, Vanessa is part of the URI um, Honors School Food Project. Um, and she wanted to mention that we have lots of information about the Justice Food Series. Um, these are all virtual programs that take place every Tuesday night through um, URI. So you should all check those out. That whole Honors Colloquium is creating equitable, sustainable. So that's the theme this year. Um, our next talk will be Thursday, November 3rd, and that will be at the Mount Pleasant Library um, with uh, Vanessa Polanco. That just got switched to virtual, though, because she unfortunately won't be in Rhode Island for that. But So you can tune in online. Um, so my, my four panelists, I'm going to, Anna volunteered earlier, so I'm going to have her go first. Um, Anna Soares is the garden leader at the Lego Court Community Gardens. And she quoted to us uh, in email earlier that gardening can have a healing effect in many ways, including lowering stress and promoting peace of mind. As a garden leader at Lego Court Community Gardens, I want to be able to share that with others, as well as encourage those that are hesitant or feel like they have to be a seasoned gardener in order to grow their own food. Um, so we'll have each panelist come up and talk a little bit, and then we can go into like an informal Q&A conversation. By the way, I, um, I did this PowerPoint, so I included a lot of slides because I'm just so excited to call our garden. I, I love it. Uh, it's such a peaceful place. So this is Gallagher community. I call it a farm because it's not a garden. It's pretty huge. And it has hills and I'm on top of that hill uh, with my bees. So the first question is like, how did I get involved in um, the community garden? So I've been gardening all my life. My I'm from the Cape Verde Island. So farming is in our blood. Um, but I started gardening at Gallagher Court when my husband passed away about two and a half years ago. And so it was like a place of healing. I'm like, okay, like, what do I do with all this grief? And so I took a class at Rick for beekeeping. And then also my friend Francisco actually guarded that Gallagher Court. And I grew up in Gallagher Court. It's a housing project. So I was a kid there. I lived there. So I know the area very well. And I used to play in what now is the garden. So there, yeah, I learned so much about healing. It helped me, you know, get one-on-one um, -on -one with nature um, and just having that calmness that I needed at the time. And so that's how I started. Um, oh, should I just? Yeah, do you want me to? Yeah, can you do it? Multitasking. You could just play this slide as it Oh, you want. So this here is like, oh my garden, like I had to choose the worst part of the garden, which is on a hill. If you go to Gallico, it's huge, but there's like a steep hill and nobody wants to garden on that hill. So I said, you know what? I like this piece here. It's in the corner. I know it's a lot of work. Let me just take over. And so that's what it looked like. Thank you. So at Gallo, the thing is too, there's a lot of Japanese now that is the worst invasive weed. So you're constantly pulling and you have to dig all of the roots out. And so that's what I had to do for this section. That's my mom. I volunteered a lot of my friends to come clean up because <laughs> I couldn't do it by myself and even kids. Um, yeah. So that's what it looked like. 
and then I built all of these around. That's where my bees are at. And then I built these beds, and then I have that area there also that I grew. Um, so this is a little bit what it looks like after. These are some of the types of things I grew gourds, tomatoes, flowers. I started um, growing vegetables, but there's like a woodchuck issue at Gallagher Court. And so I remember growing these beautiful heirloom tomatoes. I was so proud. I'm like, look at my tomatoes. And the next day, you'll see a picture of they actually put a picture of, like they just ate all my tomatoes. They just take, took a chunk of it and just left it there. I said, well, maybe if I leave a little bit of veggies for them, they'll just eat those. But no, they prefer the ones in my garden. <laughs> So that, um, so that's garlic, scapes, my bees. There's my mom. And Drew's another gardener. Um, that's Isabel. She's another uh, gardener as well at Galago. That's Francisco. He has me with the kids. I actually, um, one of the advice that I always give is always try to grow your uh, fruits or vegetables from seed um, because the first year I grew it from seed and I had such an amazing um uh, like fruits and vegetables and flowers and then so this year i was a little bit lazy <laughs> and so i said you know what let me go purchase some seedlings and they were not as beautiful or tasty as um the first time when i uh sold my own and grew indoors those are my bees i'm also a beekeeper there i have four hives um and it's an interesting house i love it um, these are some of the other uh, gardeners. So some of them grow corn, get some Egyptian onions, and um, I forgot what those are. The road, uh, I forgot what those flowers are. No, it's not cosmos. They call them Rhodobecchia. Yes, Rodebecchia. yes. Yeah. Rodebecchia. Here's my butter and squash, and then I don't know why my cucumber turned out that dirty thing. Some garlic. <laughs> some scapes. Um, another advice is um, just, you know, when I started gardening, I wanted to grow everything. I'm like, I'm going to grow this, I'm going to grow that, you know, try it, start small um, with a couple of plants and get to know uh, about that plant, learn about that plant, research that plant. That way, um, you don't, you're not just, you know, confused of what to do. So you'll have like a couple like, okay, this needs to be watered, this needs this type, this uh, much sun or whatever. Um, I didn't do that, although I was pretty successful, but I felt like I was like, you know, trying to um, figure things out as they go. And also just be patient, like be patient with your garden. I used to go every day, I'm like, okay, is it growing, is it growing, <laughs> you know? And so be patient and don't give up. Um, I recall like I had a whole bunch of kale growing and then um, the woodchucks came and they just ate everything. And, and I could have just quit gardening. And a lot of the gardeners that start gardening at Gallagher, once that happens, they just give up and they don't return the next year. Don't do that. You know, eventually just figure out what the woodchucks do not like or um, and then plant that as long as it's useful for you. Uh, I also, these are kids that live at Galgo Court Projects, and so they're also excited about gardening, and they love it, and so I got them involved, and they come, and they help me garden, and it's just good, like, that's less work for me to do. They're like, Miss Anna, can I do that? I'm like, oh, sure. Yeah, so this is the woodchuck. This is what they do. Um, another thing, too, that I could say in advice uh, is to uh, mulch. Um, if you mulch, you'll have to water less and also it keeps your um, plants moist and then your weeds too it, cut, it controls the weeds so definitely mulch my friend francisco who is like a master gardener that's all he does he does like sort of a lasagna um uh beds um which he just layers he doesn't dig or anything and he never has any weeds and he could be away for like a month and um like his his crops are so beautiful and they grow so big and delicious. Um, what else? I'm thinking another advice. Um, yeah, I think I'm sure I'm gonna leave some other stuff for you guys, but I think that's that's that. Um, I would say a challenge at Gallagher Court is because I'm on the hill. There was like no water source, so 
Um, it was difficult to water my, I had to rely a lot on rain. And finally we purchased like hoses and we had to connect like three or four hoses to get to where I'm at. I um, mean, that became a little bit better, but then I had to go back and back and forth. And then also um, with the, um, just bringing compost and other things to where I'm at um, was really hard because I had to like go all around and then try to go up the hill. But now they made it a little bit more feasible because they created a path to where we're at at the top. Yeah. So, any questions? <laughs> Do you, have, do you guys have any questions for me? Great. Thank, you. Thank you. And Doug, since you're looking at me, you're up next. <laughs> <laughs> grab my. All right. So, Thank you so much. Doug Vicker is the lead gardener at Peace and Plenty Community Garden, located on Peace Street in the Northern Elmwood neighborhood in Providence. He has led the garden into more of a whole system thinking model, which includes returning organic material to the soil planting a food corridor, a mulch corridor, and engendering more of an appreciation of natural cycles we and invertebrate friends. Well, it's wonderful to be here. Um, and I have, I made some notes because I work off notes. Um, and perhaps I have notes if these, if these could be copied for people sure. to take with yeah. them, so that can that. you can take them with you and, you know, use them as you go. Um, anyways, um, gardening for me started a long time ago when I was a little kid and it started with scavenging. So I grew up in a meat and potatoes family in rural Massachusetts in a town that had more cows and people and a lot of woods and um, a natural abundance of things, except I didn't like meat as a little kid. And so I looked for alternatives and I found a lot. So I learned really early a lot of the weeds, what we consider weeds, are very nutritional and edible and um, and so so anyway so and fast forward um, I was a gardener at the Somerset Community Garden at uh, Somerset Community of Interest. I moved to Providence in nineteen in the mid eighties, so I've been here for a while. And um, and um, the Somerset Garden, I think, was the first garden that Southside Community Land Trust created like 41 years ago. Peace and Plenty Garden is, was established in 1986. So that is quite a while ago also. And uh, it's a garden that has over 40 plots. And it's a very diverse garden. And it needs to be because it, it's situated in one of the most diverse neighborhoods in, in Rhode Island. So the litmus test, one of the litmus tests of if we're being successful in terms of demographics is do the faces of the garden look like the faces in the neighborhood? And the, and the answer to that is yeah, pretty close, pretty close. We have gardeners from different religions, gardeners, many who are immigrants, many who don't speak fluent English, um, and many who also have been market gardeners for many, many years, and many who are growing for, for themselves. So the whole notion of community garden, so I said, well, what does community mean? So when I started at Peace and Plenty, because it's just two streets north of my home, and I could wheel a wheelbarrow there through the neighborhood, and neighbors had never seen anybody wheel a wheelbarrow through this neighborhood. In, um, in the south side. And um, so we're breaking barriers in a lot of different ways. Anyway, so um, <clears throat> um, there were only three people from the neighborhood gardening in that garden. And so this really needs to shift because this is, a, this is not a community garden. And so what we did is we really created, much of the garden wasn't built out for community gardens, but people were just sort of planting things in maybe more of a third of the garden that wasn't even established as a garden uh, garden plots. So we established those as garden plots. We composted, 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 and we got to 49 garden plots of different sizes. Some are small, not that small, but small, and some are quite big. And um, we encourage people who are coming uh, for the first time, especially if they don't have gardening experience to start with small. 
and people see a garden in the spring and everybody's all happy and they can do it all. And then, you know, July comes and the weeds are this high and it's, it, it becomes, and you have to water and it becomes more work than a lot of people might want. So we want people to be successful. So how can we stage in people being successful? Um, so um, advice, lots of advice. So one of the things, um, when you um, think short term, what can you grow in the short term? Think seasonal, what can you grow throughout the different phases of the season? Because some crops like the early time, some crops want the whole time, and some crops will do better maybe in the later time. And also, um, uh, where are my notes here? Um, and think generational. So what I mean by that is, um, is that think about planting things that will produce for many, many, many years. So it's one of the things that we began during the pandemic at Peace and Plenty Garden is to plant a food corridor, something we call a food corridor. Now the garden is about 200 feet long and about 100 feet deep and mostly around the whole outer perimeter of the garden. We got in and we worked the soil. The soil had never been, as far as I know, never been really worked. We pulled out 70 trees. A lot of them were weed trees, Norway maples that are invasive, uh, different kinds of trees of heaven. Um, and, uh, and we work the soil and we began to plant. So now we have blueberries, we have blackberries, we have raspberries, we have asparagus, we have rhubarb, we have Jerusalem artichokes, we have pear trees, we have apple trees, we have grapevines. Um, what else do we have? We've got a lot of things that are growing that are not necessarily, we can't actually harvest, but in five years, there will be a harvest. And the other thing that we have done at the community garden is we put a free table outside the garden gate. And, and um, it didn't work out this year because of the drought and some other things that happened in the garden. But one of the things that, um, <clears throat> so we put, so gardeners will put um, their overage produce. And anybody in the neighborhood who wants can come and take it no questions asked. So what is a community garden? What does community mean? So community means that you know, we're behind a chain link fence. It has a lock. You need to pay a fee. Fees are forgiven if you can't, if you can't afford it. Um, but it's behind a fence and it keeps most of the community out. So how can we make that fence more permeable? And what can we do to, to, to increase its permeability both ways? getting more of the community in the garden and sh sharing out the bounty of the garden with the community itself. And the free, the free stand is one way to do that. So bringing people into the community garden, we, I'm just, I just met with a class from the Wheeler School in Providence today. And uh, so they had a tour of the community garden and they're part of a city side project. And they're, it's a very interesting program at the Wheeler School. Um, where they're really looking at a lot of things, community, and um, creating projects around their interest level, um, and uh, and publishing actually, they're, they're publishing their work, which is really terrific. So happy to give people tours. Um, we have hosted um, events in the garden. We've had nonprofits who have had meetings in the garden. Um, we have had boards of directors who had their meetings in the garden, all neighborhood organizations. So th we think of the garden as a resource for the community in many ways. Primarily it's food, primarily it's growing food. But secondarily, I don't even know if I like that word, but it's also other things. So think about what your community garden can be for the community and how you're creating action plans to, to bring that into, into fruition. 
Um, so, um, <clears throat> um, and I say also think four season gardening. And you say, four season gardening, if it's winter, you can't. Well, carrots can still be in the ground. I mean, even if it snows, if we don't get a freezing rain, there can be kale under the snow. And you just scrape the snow off and pick your kale. Freezing rain kind of hurts those, kills those crops. But um, oftentimes if you, especially in a, in a milder winter, these, these seasons can be, can be really, really extended. Um, think rainwater collection, and you were mentioning your, your gardening on the hill. Yeah, so we had a drought, like six weeks of drought. It was, it was by report, the harshest drought that we've had on record in Rhode Island. And then at, right after the drought, we had 10 inches of rain. So what happens? Well, how do we, how do we adjust to all of that? So I think community gardening, we need to also think about how we can build in these sort of weather differences and climate resistances in terms of how we're thinking about planting, what we're planting, and our practices for caring about planting. We had one spigot, similar to the Lego, with a 150 foot hose that we were going all over the place. And you know what? The gardeners who couldn't get there to water every day lost practically everything. The gardeners who could get there and water did fairly okay. We didn't have anyone in the garden that got a cucumber this year. Um, and then it rained. And everybody is going like, oh my God, it's raining, yay, yay. We love the rain. Of course we love the rain. But guess what else loves the rain? The weeds. So the weeds flourished. The corn that was, that was dwarfed and about this high never really grew much more with the rain because it was just wasted with the drought. Um, but the, the amaranth, um, uh, the mugwort. <laughs> so a lot of the a lot of the plants that we consider weeds just fulminated, just came over, and the gardens that weren't really taken care of because of the drought became these islands of weeds in the garden. Well, are islands of weeds okay in a garden? And I advocate that they are because if they create a habitat for our four-footed friends and invertebrates. So the other thing that we created in the garden was a mulch corridor along the back fence of the garden, 200 feet. And, um, and we took our cues from an oak tree that we began observing and the oak tree would drop its leaves and the leaves would stand. And there seemed to be like more crickets under the oak tree than there were like in other places in the garden. So we did some research and we found out that Oak leaves decompose in about two years. So every year they get another layer. So the layers get higher. So the invertebrates live there. And a lot of those invertebrates are helpful, are our gardening friends. So we created a mulch corridor with leaves and we keep bringing more leaves in. And we're inviting neighbors when they're raking to bring their leaves and put them into the garden. And guess what we've noticed last year? First year, we noticed more crickets up in that area of the garden. So is a community garden just for people? Or really is it about encouraging nature to return to a different kind of a balance? And I think a lot of our gardening, especially in the Western culture, um, we till up the ground, we pull out everything we don't want, we plant in rows, and, and there we have a row of corn. Um, people, from, people from different cultures approach it differently. So learn from them. There was a woman in the garden who was unfortunately killed, a 79 year old woman crossing the street in Providence in August. Nobody should in Providence anywhere be killed while they're trying to cross the street by a car. She was 79 years old. She didn't speak much English. 
but she knew how the garden was. And I believe that she had an individual relationship with each plant that she planted. It wasn't just a row of corn. These were individual kind of beings sharing space with. So take that in in any way you want, but think about, um, think about kind of expanding how, how you think about, about community, about community garden, gardening. And um, also think vertical. So some of the things that came back, to a certain extent, tomatoes, peppers, came back after the drought and the rain, um, and some squashes came back after the drought and the rain. The squashes had, because of the drought, there were more, there was infestations of insects that kind of fulminated that were eating the plants, and then the rain came, and then there was, there was um, uh, leaf mildew that happened, especially on the, on the uh, squash plants. So a way to circumvent some of that is to think vertical, to plant vertically. And it allows more airflow and uh, you just have to keep tying things up. You have to stay, you have to stay with it. Luckily, we don't have groundhogs, but we have squirrels, like you can't even believe. And during the drought, squirrels were actually digging up potatoes out of somebody's garden and taking them up they were thirsty, they were hungry. I've never seen this world eat a potato in my 70 something years of life. And so, um, so we said, well, what can we do about this? You know, um, so the garden of growing potatoes didn't want to grow there anymore. So switched to plot and other people took those, took those plots. Potatoes are not being grown there anymore. But what we did is we put up some bird baths so the squirrels could have some place to go drink. So let's think, let's think cycles of nature. Let's be inclusive about who we're thinking about, who deserves and needs a place in the garden. Um, so I've got lots more to say, but I know other people have too, and uh, we have some great people following. So if we can make some copies of this and people can take them, that would be, that would be terrific. Thank you. That's a question on camera. Yeah. Can you utilize that as a green? Is it the same as the green or is it the it is. one that has the leaves? Okay. So there's so uh, there, you know, since since I was a scavenger when I was a kid, so I learned a lot of plants you could eat. Um, and a lot of what we identify as weeds and pull out in Western culture are edible. Mm -hmm. And amaranth is prized in certain cultures. Certain types of amaranth are prized more for other. So there's a certain type of amaranth that is grown for the seed head. And that seed head can have thousands of seeds in it. But if, it, if you don't harvest it at the right time, those seeds will go into the garden, seed bomb, and you'll have amaranth everywhere you'll have an amaranth bloom across your garden like crazy, yeah. all right? But we in the Western society, we wanna, we wanna have lettuce, we wanna have spinach, we wanna have, you know, we wanna do these kinds of things. We don't prize, we don't understand how to eat amaranth. We don't understand how to eat a lot of the other plants that, that grow as weeds. And um, if you do interplanting and do allow some weeds and some weed islands in your garden, um, a lot of the weeds have deeper roots than our domestic grown plants, which have more shallow root systems. Now, in a drug system also, I, there's evidence that, um, that when the soil dries out, there's salt in the soil, but it's down lower because the rain keeps it down. But when it's not, when it's not so rainy, it gets the salt levels increased as you come up to the top of the soil. So the soil actually becomes more salty in a drought condition. But when you're planting, when you're planting um, more deep rooted crops, and if you've dug some of these weeds up, or you've dug burdock up, you know how, how these roots, they take hold. And um, so they're down there and they're serving a purpose to help keep the salt 
down. So it's a, it's a complicated affair. Um, and uh, there's lots to think about. You know, you can approach this very simply, get a plot, plant some things, see how they, how they do, observe, reflect on how they've done, and make changes as you go, and just have fun gardening. Or you can really make it something that is really going to help address our climate situation in our in our society and our world. Thanks. Tarshir put your slide up next. So Tarshir is a self-taught artist who has used creativity as a catalyst for change for people experiencing homelessness, addiction, domestic abuse, PTSD, and other forms of trauma. She worked for five years as a Department of Corrections mental health discharge planner and is the founder of Roots to Empower, formerly known as Restoration Urban Farm of New England. This social enterprise seeks to break, break the cycle of recidivism, recidivism by, providing business and, <laughs> by providing business and agricultural training to formerly incarcerated adults and at risk youth. Tarshir holds an MA in public administration from Northeastern University and an MA in mental health counseling from Boston University. She's also an herbalist and URI master Thank you. So, so um, I, what's the questions? You have questions, then? I do have I might go off, um, go no, off yeah, the do, cuff phone. Do whatever you want. This, this is an informal <laughs> event. <laughs> so. We're here to learn, have fun, chat with one another. So my organization I started when I was um, actually working at the Department of Corrections at the Mental Health Discharge Planner. Um, uh, what I saw happening when I discharged, I was the only, let me just make this clear, the only mental health discharge planner for all of the units at the DOC. Um, so what I witnessed was people coming back and forth inside the prison system. Um, and part of it was because of certain barriers they faced when they were outside. Um, a lot of people don't know if you don't haven't interacted with people that are um, been incarcerated before. Um, this state is a little bit different, is that they have a public portal where um, people can employers can actually search for people's names um, in the system once they get your resume, and then based on that information, they can never call you back. They will never call you back. You won't know why. Um, so I figured in my own mind that I know that the barriers were housing employment, particularly. Um, that to curtail that issue, especially with the employment piece, was to create a entrepreneurship program using agriculture as the basis for it. So that's basically what Roots to Empower is. Um, the focus of it is, is to actually um, pair entrepreneurship with um, ag and STEM education. Based on my brother. So this is my brother, a formerly incarcerated, um, uh, formerly incarcerated gentleman. Um, I'm from Boston and he was incarcerated back in the 90s. He served five years. Um, he completed his sentence when he left and was unable to find employment. Um, he had taken some construction classes that night at a vocational school um, and it became depressed because he couldn't find employment. He's putting himself out there with no luck. Um, I co-signed for his first van. Um, he was able to purchase some tools and then he started this company, which is still existing now in the Boston area and is employing the same people in the community that we came up from. So people in the Boston area that have you know, records, um, history of um, incarceration. Um, and he's the reason why I decided, so the DLC is one reason, but he's also the reason that shows that if people are provided with the skills to develop their own businesses, that they can become successful and not having to rely on just trying to find employment when employment's not, what well, people are not necessarily calling them back for employment um, in the community. And this is what it looks like. So, my garden space is in Pawtucket. Um, it's on a, I just realized, just found out it's on a public park <clears throat> um, land, 29,000 square feet. So that dead end street, um, residential. Um, the growing space is where I grow all of the, right now I'm growing a lot of kale. I'm part of a pilot program um, where I'm growing a lot of kale um, for people that are above the poverty line. Um, but still are food insecure in the province area. So that's um, what this group is going towards, um, along with the growth that I grew um, last year. So this is um, 
Well, we're gonna have like some little recycling, some not recycling, but some composting bins and then any round stuff. Um, I also have do you know my, see my big thing <laughs> right there. So I have um I was telling last year, um I had um a, this gentleman helped me till. Um he brought his mom out there also to kind of help out um kind of get this um the land um prepped for spring planting. And this was us planting garlic in the fall. It was like food. So garlic is only planted from October, I say mid-October, late October until July. So you plant it like now, close, real close, and then it won't be harvested until next year, next July. And so this is the crew that helped me this year. Um, so we have two master gardeners. The site is a master gardener um, site. Um, so we have two master gardeners, and then we have Vishnu, who, who's the Southside Community Land Trust. Um, Powerhouse who left us, yeah, she, <laughs> she left. Um, but this lady right here, she's small, but she's got power. Um, and then this gentleman, um, because I the space is open, um, we have I have a homeless camp living there. So Alex, um, who was there camping out, um, actually helped us plant um, this year. This is some of the kale that's still there. I'm planting. It's harvesting every so often. So I try to put like this sign to deter people, like cameras watching you. That don't work. They don't, they don't care. They don't care. <laughs> they will chop the kale. They pick the garlic. They, I went back um, last week, and all my red onions were gone. That were not high high bed. So I'm like, okay, so they won't really cook in. But there were um, like over here a, whole, a bunch of tents um, that have since been moved. So I guess the city got wind that the camp was there. I didn't report them. Um, I work from a homeless advocate, um, and they forced them to leave the land, so they're no longer there. And um, I don't have a greenhouse space um, as much as I'd like to, but I started seedling. So for me, you can do two things. Like Doug said, you can start seeds. I think Anna said, start with seeds or seedlings. I started my own seed starts at a greenhouse at um, a summer queen farm in Seekonk, they were um, gracious enough to let me use that space. They charged me decent, it's pretty reasonable um, to use it for the whole summer. And so some of those, um, some of these plants I sold to residents and I gave some out to other, you know, low income people. And then the rest I planted um, in the space that I have. And this is the second year that I've had, because I'm an environmental justice person as well. Um, Doug mentioned environmental justice and they all go hand in hand. So if our earth is, you know, if we have droughts and we have, it's, you know, a lot of rain, um, it affects um, the growing season, it's gonna affect everything. Um, so if we don't have, if, without addressing environmental issues, our food source is gonna be, it's gonna be like non-existent, right? It's gonna be messed up. Um, so we all come together. We have um, um, various groups. We have civic leaders um, in the community, um, residents in the community, and all of these folks that sponsor, they come out. And we just talk about how we can address the environmental issues in our state. Um, and this is the second year that we've had the um, Earth Day at um, Houston Power. And this is some of the, the activities that happen at that Earth Day. So that's Cynthia Mendez, who ran for um, Lieutenant Governor this year. Um, she's a Pawtucket resident, um, and then we had some youth that were there um, as well with you know residents that were there and their parents. So I'm a homeless advocate, like I said, and so we also got involved in different things in the community. This was Wilson Street Encampment that was in Providence that was getting a lot of attention in the news. Um, so we came over and did some cleanup. Um, we had a cookout one day. We had the governor. And nobody, nobody knew that because it wasn't the news, but the governor came along with. Um, the lieutenant governor and spoke directly because I said, I don't want to be the voice for our homeless people because they need to tell their story. You know what I mean? They need to be the one to tell their story. And he sat and he talked with um, the homeless folk that were there for about an hour and a half. So we got to hear about um, what was happening, what they saw was the problem or issues with housing or homeless and reasons why they were homeless. And he got to hear them directly. So um, they're no longer there. Um, they have since been uprooted, but was, they were there for a couple of months. And I also do a lot of stuff with youth in the community. Um, at the second rec center, um, I have um, been there at least 
three or four times. I could, would like to be there a lot more if I work full time. <laughs> um, just to get the kids, um, you know, um, talking about planting or what that looks like. Um, I brought in tubers and they got to feel what that is. Or, like um, just a show and tell. Like they got to feel like um, they got grossed up by the worms, but I brought some worms <laughs> in. And, but the, guy, the, the boys don't have a problem with the gross thing. So this is what um, another project that I um, sometimes do. And then this is some, some of us just hanging out, doing what we do. Mm -hmm. and, <laughs> so we're just spending 2021. <laughs> And so now, like I said, food distribution 2022 um, is happening now where I'm just growing stuff to actually give to um, low-income folks in the province area. Um, I like to think of the organiz my organization as trying to address, and I'm probably crazy, but a lot of issues, like environmental issues, social issues, um, of course, formerly incarcerated folk who are homeless because um, they're being discharged of homelessness, it goes hand in hand. But I like to encompass a lot of things. And right now, one of the projects that we're kind of spearheading is looking at offshore wind as one of those avenues for training for our folks. Um, and I have a bunch of Brown students actually write, writing a white paper to analyze that. So that's in the horizon right now. I think that's it. All right. You said at the beginning you're an artist as well. And yeah. I'm just wondering like how that fits into this work at the moment. Um my brain is an artist. So I like I can't be he's very Doug is very like um you're very like um meticulous about your planning. I I just artist stuff. Too. I'm I just dancer. plan you really I'm a dancer. But you're meticulous in how you coordinate your garden space. It's I'm not precise. like that. <laughs> I'm not I'm like let's plan and see what happens. Um so I'm not I'm not at all like that. I'm just, I'm, I like to learn by experimentation. And so I think that even if you make a mistake the first year, you'll know what not to do the next year. So it doesn't really matter um, to me um, how I start off. It's just, to me, it's, I treat it like a learning experience. Um, so that's how my artist brain thinks is to just do it. Like, you know, and I'm, I'm abstract too, I'm abstract by myself. So. Um, yeah. Yeah. Love it. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I heard about plants today. He does. Did you help him? Did you help him play? You like plants? You should continue to do that. Um, and flowers and something. Nice. Wow. <laughs> Did you get to eat any of the tomatoes? Are they big ones or small? Yeah, the big ones are cherry tomatoes. Do you like the cherry tomatoes? Are they red or yellow? Did you ever eat green tomatoes? You can make things with green tomatoes. You can make fried green tomatoes. Mm -hmm. Okay, I can. Uh, I'll just start talking. Well, let me and... introduce you. Oh, no. I gave everyone else the same. Okay, Yours, so. I wrote myself. Oh, no. <laughs> Fatima Maswood is a cultural worker, artist, and seed steward who partnered with the Community Libraries of Providence and founded the Providence Seed Library. The seed library effort began through the artist residency program with the province's Office of Sustainability and has expanded through a partnership with the province libraries. Additional components of the project include design and construction training for the demonstration of garden beds and educational programming that connected with the Community Libraries of Providence and the PBD and Access Program. Hi, everyone. Um, Thank you to everyone who spoke. It's, like, it's an honor to, you know, to follow your presentation. I'm just going to give like a quick introduction to a program that I worked with the librarians to set up. And it's something like if you want to take seeds out of the seed library, they're here. Um, and Amy is hard at work getting the website up because there's a website and there's a couple of resources that I want to share with people if they decide that they want to interact with the resource. Um, for some of the context behind where it came from, um, where do I start? So in 2020, I got some funding through the City of Providence Office of Sustainability and a group called the Racial Environmental Justice Coalition, the REJC. And um, part of their ask in hiring me was to work on something that was a tie-in with the city's climate justice plan, which is a doc it's like an amazing document 
that the REJC worked on. And um, so it was supposed to be a public project that could hold, like um, push some of the goals of the REJC and that connected some of my personal practice. Um, where I'm coming from is my formal training, what I do for work is I'm a landscape architect and I teach landscape architecture. And definitely like the love of my life where I want to be is working with plants, um, making plant medicine and my hands in the soil. So, um, and seeds in particular, like there's um, the practice of working with seeds is definitely really connected to my family history. My mom comes basically from like a peasant farming background in, in North Africa and Tunisia. And I grew up with these stories. Um, Actually, if, if people are familiar with the history of the Green Revolution, which is not the big kind of revolution, um, it's like a whole longer, more complicated conversation. But basically, like it was a period of time in which farming, and this is something that was happening throughout Africa, basically people who were farming with indigenous seeds were pushed to literally, like often in many instances, literally hand over our traditional seeds and have them replaced with um, subsidized seeds or, you know, so, um, we have that story in my family history, but in my mom's generation, basically like the, or my mom's generation and starting in the previous generation, like the loss of traditional seeds that my mom says by her estimation, there's seeds that my family have been growing since before the Roman colonization of North Africa. So that's like thousands of years of history. Um, so seeds were something like they, practice of working with seeds and interest in seeds like at some point in my life I've described it to people as like a switch going off in my brain like it's I was just fascinated with them everywhere I went I was like trying to take seeds out of plants and like bring them home and <laughs> they're always in my pockets they're still always in my pockets um it's a laundry it's kind of gross sometimes <laughs> but um so this brings us to it's 2020 I have gotten this um support from these two groups the sustainability um office and the rhc and also this interesting thing that happened at the beginning of the pandemic where all of these seed companies sold out of seeds because there was this really intense interest like in that in that moment where i mean everything is still weird but everything was really weird in that moment but also people were both kind of fearful of food insecurity they were like we're dealing with like systems breakdown and also we're um had more time to like connecting with things that they're interested in connecting with. So tons of seed companies sold out. There were shortages everywhere. So I was think, thinking about all of these conversations compounding and also what it means to be building small scale resilience close to home, to be um, learning different forms of self sufficiency in community and sharing skills and also holding on to ancestral skills. Um, so I started working on the seed library and trying, and I was able to link up with Amy really early on, which was amazing. I'm really glad that I could do that. And um, the seed library from start to the present, it's been two years now, has been completely a collaboration with definitely mostly librarians and also a lot of other people who've contributed a lot of energy to it. So earlier I mentioned that there were youth and beauty and makers at Fair Umbrella who worked on building and maintaining the gardens. They've continued. They also built another garden at Wanstek Library and they stayed involved in the project. Um, I'm going to just show you really quickly the website and then two of the resources. Um, one was created with the basically like entirely by librarians and it's an amazing resource. And the other one is something that I've been working on with two friends, Donna Hang and TJ Jimenez, and they've been helping me build out this resource so that people, um, I'll explain it when I get to it. Um, so this is a website. I have been meaning to work on it and make it better for a long time, but it, it hasn't happened yet. Um, if you click on current seed library catalog, you get to this page don't get to this page, you get to this page. Oh, that's okay. Um, so this is something that Gail Yallop, who's the systems coordinator for Community Libraries of Providence set up. And it's, um, it works because so many librarians, like when we package and bring them seeds, they put them in the catalog. So what that means is if you're interested, for example, in herbs and medicinal plants, you can click on this category and you can scroll through and see what's available in the library and what branch you can find it at. 
And it's not totally consistent just because librarians have a lot to do. So sometimes they're not always cataloged. Sometimes they're just available in that branch. Um, and that's fine. And um, if they're here, you can also um, have them sent to like your local library branch. If you'd like to do that, you can put them on hold. I'm not using the right library lingo. <laughs> but, you know. Get it, it pops up on our hold list and then we send it out. I treat placing holds at the library like online shopping. Like if I, I'm like, just throw it in the bag. Like, oh. um, sorry. It's, it's free though. It's, it's, it's better than online. Shopping. It's better than online shopping. So, um, and this resource has. There's only one other seed library that I know of where you can do this. It's the library seed library in Pima, Pima County, Arizona, which is what I look to for inspiration. And I thought it was like an outrageous ask. Like I showed it to Gail and I was like, this seems complicated, but I think it's cool. And she was like, um, but um, when you're taking seeds out of the library, they're not in their original package because I'll break up seed packages to make it like a small, you know, to be able to distribute more. So um, oftentimes instructions for how to start seeds are on the seed packet and that's what a lot of people look to and so it was a thing that was coming up that people weren't totally sure how to start different seeds and it's an extra step um, to do the research on that so it's not perfect we're working on a print print guide right now but what um, we started doing that I'm, I've had a lot of fun doing is every seed that has come into the seed library um, I put into a completely wild spreadsheet. I have a lot of Capricorn in my astrological chart and I love spreadsheets. Um, it's like a little embarrassing, but anyway, we worked on the spreadsheet and with CJ and Donna, we've basically been um, putting images. So these are, these are all things that have come through the seed library. They're not all necessarily available right now. It's just like every type of seed that has ever been in it. I forgot to mention at the beginning that part of the focus, um, the goal of the seed library is also to have um, open pollinated seeds, culturally resonant seeds for different communities that live here and um, indigenous seeds. So, um, and open pollinated seeds are seeds that you can save from one season to the next. So oftentimes like, Every year, I don't know if people have seen the seed distribution, like Burpee will donate a lot of seeds to different organizations. And a lot of those are really good seeds. They're usually not organic and they're um, often hybridized. That doesn't mean they're bad seeds. It just means that like saving them is kind of inconvenient and complicated. So, um, and I, um, I don't want to talk too long. So if you have questions about particular things or like what an open pollinated seed means or what it means to save seeds, feel free to ask. I love talking about this. You can probably, I don't know what's available right now, but I think there are oh, seeds yeah. over there. We can do it like indoor tour. Oh yeah. Seed. I should have like brought them and like held up. They're in our old cat card catalog tours. No, no. Yeah. 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 <laughs> They're cute. I think they look good, right? They really do. Liz, yeah. Lindsay at the desk will have to give her a shout out so she she did that little display over there Lindsay set up the display and also for a lot of them like literally hand labeled on like we were doing a lot of digital printing and it was taking a long time and Lindsay like hand labeled and packed like thousands of seats yeah so it's yeah I've gotten a lot of help and um if you're interested in being involved there's some um, See packing days that I mentioned that are really fun. They're really sweet. And oh yeah, yes. can I grab that? Demo it. Yes. Thanks, Kevin. <laughs> or he's been away. I'll just hold it in front of the camera. So this is what it looks like. We're at the end of the season, but we still have a lot of things here. Um, look at these cute little packages. Everyone should take some because we do oh. have a lot of them. Oh yeah, please take some and. Um, this is from a donation of literally 10,000 cowpeas that someone sent me last year. And the librarians were like, no more cowpeas. <laughs> but cowpeas are very important and, you know, beautiful crop. They're one of the oldest domesticated plants domesticated in Africa. And, uh, um, and they're stored in this material that's called glassine. And part of the goal of that is that it kind of helps control moisture and pH. So 
seats do have an ideal storage. They have ideal storage preferences. And if it's like a public resource where people can look through it, like you can't really maintain those ideal conditions. So that was kind of like part of the goal of that was to maintain seat viability. But it's it's a public community resource and people are also bringing seeds in. So it's not always perfect. A lot of seeds are donated. So it's not always going to yield as much as like buying you know new seeds that year. But I think part of the hope in this is just that people anyone who's interested in gardening and is curious about growing a particular kind of plant can find some seeds and plant them and build a relationship with the plant world and maybe distribute some seeds if they want to do that and hopefully bring them back. We've had a few people bring them back. Really? Cool. I just want to seeds. I have guidelines, but I want to check with you first because I want to know what. Well, yeah. We can. The catalog and piece is easy now that it's starting. So we yeah. have all the categories. So once we know what they are, we can easily add them. So, um, and most of the locations all have them. So we, we also share the wealth of the other nine local community libraries and provinces. Cool. I, the, I have a um, container of cosmos seeds that are open source. My father grew them, and he died in 1976, and I've been saving the seeds every year, and they're still growing. And we have a whole cosmos weed area in Peace and Plenty Garden, and uh, it's a place where the little people probably have a home. And uh, so I'd be really thrilled to go yeah. those cosmos seeds. Yeah, definitely bring them. You can drop them off. So there's the branches that have that are like formally part of the seed library are Washington Park, Knight Memorial, Wanskuk, Rochambeau, and Mount Pleasant. I can't believe I almost forgot Mount Pleasant. That's like such an insult to Lee. He's um, one. I know he's <laughs> We did a lot of we oh we also hosted a series of workshops last year. Um, we've had a lot of cool programming linked up with this, and it's been really fun to work on. Um, so you can bring seeds to one of those libraries, and I have some guidelines for how to label everything that I need to be better about publicizing. Um, I'm gonna think about that. But there's a website, there's an Instagram. And um, there's a lot of librarians that are really amazing resources that are like. And can that story of those seed, saving seeds be told somehow? No. That's another whole thing. Yeah, so I got a lot of stuff. Right? <laughs> it, was that nice, it was that nice article. That's that the human too, side. They wrote about you got you and right. Lee were in that, right? Oh, yeah. When I was out on leave. Yeah, that was really nice. I was in the right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You can reach out to health equity zones because when they're doing community outreach, they really do require to grant sewer for these providence health equity zones. And we have friendly uh, community resources, and this would be better than all of the material. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 So, have you tried to save seeds directly from like, like whatever you're growing? <laughs> Like the process for it, like, like say, like a pepper. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's saving seeds from. I've learned a lot. I had been like, um, I had started saving seeds and like informally swapping them with people. Um, just I told you it was like you know at some point you become interested in it and you're like thinking about it all the time, and. I think through the process of this practice, I had started to learn some of the more particular things. Then through working on this, like I really had to skill up in some way. People were asking me a lot of questions. So there's a lot of the, on these. Um, I categorized. This is the thing I want to keep working on. It's on the um, air table, like on that um, the page that has all the plants. But a lot of things have like a seed saving difficulty, like if it's easy medium or hard and then it's hard to gauge that but part of that is like if you like for example if you plant like a pea it's a self-pollinating plant so if you save the seed from it there's a really good chance if you plant that you'll get the same thing but if you're planting like a squash because it has a higher likelihood of cross-pollinating if you're saving those seeds there's a higher likelihood that the next year you might get something you're not expecting so that's kind of how i tried to um share that information but and then there were also workshops but if you get like 
pretty technical and fast. Right. Yeah. So I'm Liz Head and I'm president of Calvin. Clicking things. Trying to find the playlist. So I was out on the internet when this happened. The season series. I think I saw that. Um, the presentation of that. Yeah, the, these these were what she was mentioning yeah, earlier. Just four seats, seat keeping. Didn't did you guys do a yeah? She was. Didn't you guys do a seed saving virtual workshop too? Uh, I didn't do one. Someone else. Okay, didn't I'll have to ask. I'll, I can ask Lee too. We did a, a seed saving virtual. One. So I was out on the youth having my baby in the fall when a lot of this happened. So I like remember it happening, but I don't remember. The details but every um lee's really good about putting stuff on the youtube channel for the libraries and the playlists mm -hmm. so i know there's a lot of like garden seed playlists and I, I believe we did a seed saving workshop as well yeah i think she after the one after the score i think she touched on it a little bit oh seed keeping yes yeah so i can bring it online for free for anyone yes yep yep and if, any of our programs that we've done whether it's a fully virtual program or a hybrid program um, if it's okay with the presenter to record and share, then we post it on our YouTube channel. So you can watch it. Yep. You guys also do a lot of Yeah. Yeah, we do a lot. <laughs> it's great. It's fun. So um, I got a small grant through uh, Rhode Island Council. Rhode Island Council of Communities. And then Sisters, you got the squash, the corn, the beans. Yeah, and then you, I think, the uh, tomatoes and I want to say tomatoes and the uh, well, peppers. You know, all of that information is um, it's really available. Um, you can look up YouTube. You know, it's really been in place has been thought about for a long, long, long time. You know, certainly Native American systems have been planted around chunks of trees that they took out as the trunk rotted the corn and the beans and the squash which grew and they grew together and the, and the corn shaded the squashes so the squash don't get burned by the hot sun etc etc et so um, you know cooking again sort of full systems as do you know if there's um, um, any Asian seed saving programs in Rhode Island? 
seeds to grow what they grow in their crops. And, um, and my sense is it's also something that that is a direct connection to the community. Um, so it's like a little bit of a wider story. And then certainly with um, among gardeners, they write seeds with them. And uh, I think that the subsequent generations of those seeds are still being planted, but they don't know how well any of that is about them. And I think it may be deserved. Talk to your friends and, <laughs> and academia. So, yeah. yeah, a lot of communities, I feel like I'm always like, every time I interact with gardeners here, I was talking to a friend recently and I had seen her mom at something and I was like, oh, is your mom into gardening? And she was like, yes, my mom grew up, like, could literally wander the mountains for months, like, finding, like, all the food she needed in Guatemala. And I was like, oh, yeah, like, there's so many people here who have such a big knowledge of the land and where things are living with the land and, like, people, you know what I mean? And also, like, and also, like, when they bring seeds and the they grow them here because you can't Thank you, everyone. Yeah, this has been wonderful. And I invite everyone to come closer and have more of a conversation.